get going here. I want to have everyone filter in. So only in Minnesota in April, right, are we going to get six inches of snow, so we'll hopefully get you out of here before your cars are all covered up. Thank you all for being here. My name is Brian Mueller. I'm a commander with the Washington County Sheriff's Office, and we are thrilled to have uh, this turnout tonight, especially given uh, busy schedules of, I see parents, grandparents, kids, uh, educators, other law enforcement officials, um, different, different elected officials here. So I really appreciate everyone taking time on your busy day for what we consider uh, one of the most important topics that we deal with today. Special thank you to Oakdale Police Chief Bill Sullivan and the Tartan High School staff for their accommodations here and their partnership in this event. As you guys have all seen walking in here, uh, open before the event and then as well after the event are a bunch of amazing Washington County resources out there for families, for kids, uh, for most all of your needs. So please visit those booths outside. I know there's a couple of you that don't want to do this, but there's a green questionnaire in your folder, so please take the time to fill this out. We read through each and every question, each and every answer that uh, you guys provide to try to make our next event better. So as we get going here, the presenters you're going to hear about today are Washington County Sheriff Bill Hutton, Washington County Attorney Pete Orpit, the Washington County Drug Task Force Commander, Sergeant Mike Benson, Tartan High School Resource Officer, Officer Tom Higgins, members of Know the Truth, Minnesota Adult Teen Challenge as well. There's also going to be several stories from those most affected by addiction. And um, one, in, one individual, Miss uh, Lori Lewis, is going to speak about uh, her family's um, tragic dealings with addiction. And you can see that uh, this event is in memory of, of Ryan Lewis. So thank you for being here and, and providing that amazing story. I'm going to give you a couple of statistics for you to think about during this event and a couple of takeaways. And I want you to think about these during, uh, during our speakers. The first is we hope that you understand the collaborative effort that we're trying to put forward uh, to fight addiction in our communities. You're going to hear from a different range of law enforcement, county attorneys like I spoke of, and hopefully you understand that there are a lot of people working towards this and we understand we can't arrest ourselves out of this issue and we're trying to find other ways to do that. Secondly, that there is no demographic and no socioeconomic status that is not affected by drug addiction. Um, I, I imagine most people here in some way, shape or form you, yourself, your loved ones, your family has been affected by drug addiction. Now part of my duties is, is to sit on the state council that oversees the uh, gang and drug task forces within the state. And there's a few stats that I'm going to give you before I introduce Sheriff Hutton that I want you to think about. Over the last five years, now this is information just from our drug task forces. It says, uh, does not include the information by our officers uh, working the streets every day, um, stepping into homes, finding drugs, or, or stopping cars. There has been a 250% increase in methamphetamine seizures over the last five years. There has been a 700% increase in marijuana seizures over the last five years. Heroin overdose, now I'm not talking about deaths, I'm talking about the overdoses from heroin have risen from 1,700 in 2008 to 3,000 in 2012. Now in 2014, we don't have the full numbers yet, but there are over 400 children projected to be taken out of homes due to drug offenses. And finally, the most alarming stat, and this is something that every time I read it, every time I talk to other law enforcement officials, we're most affected by. We deal with a lot of car crashes uh, in our career and see horrific, um, horrific crashes. In 2013, for the first time, the state of Minnesota lost more individuals to drug overdoses than we do to car crashes. So with that, I would like to introduce Washington County Sheriff Bill Hutton. Sheriff Hutton comes to us with a, uh, a unique experience um, in this community. This is his 31st year in law enforcement. He spent the first 23 years right here in this community with the Oakdale Police Department in a variety of capacities to include captain of patrol investigations. He was elected to office in 2006, and this is his beginning of his third term in January of 2015. And part of what he did in his assignment was he was a juvenile investigator assigned to Tartan High School back as an Oakdale Police Captain. Sheriff Hutton. Thank you. Thank you, Brian. And again, I'd like to reiterate what Brian just said. Thank you all for being here. It's, uh, the message that you're going to hear tonight is uh, very, very important. Um, I'm going to take over a little bit where Brian left off when it comes some, to some statistics. And I'm also, or, and then following me in a little bit will be uh, commander of our drug task force, Sergeant uh, Benson. He's going to talk about even a little bit more into the weeds as to what's happening within our communities. 
There's no doubt that alcohol use and abuse continues to be our number one issue that we deal with amongst young people. But equally alarming is the use of drugs among young folks, uh, regardless of where they live. In Washington County, we continue to see the use of marijuana, methamphetamine, cocaine, heroin, pharmaceuticals, and synthetic, synthetic drugs continue to plague our communities. This evening, you're going to hear a couple of themes, hopefully. Hopefully, you'll have takeaways of partnerships and also what prescription medications is doing uh, to our community. Unfortunately, our young folks are dying uh, as a result of overdoses. In 2013, Washington County had 16 deaths related to drug overdose, to opiate overdoses. We had 15 in 2014, and for, through the first three months of 2015, we've had seven overdoses. And again, this does not include the number of medical saves that the commander talked about just a little bit ago. What is leading up to these uh, drug overdoses? Often it is pharmaceuticals or opiates. And what are we doing about it? Washington County Sheriff's Office, in partnership with the Washington County Public Health, partnered to develop a Take It to the Box program. And basically that is just a program that individuals can anonymously just drop off their unused medications in a box. Why are we doing that? You're going to hear a little bit more as we go. We're doing that because so many folks are becoming addicted to pharmaceuticals. And the first three years that we began our program, in three years we've already destroyed 14,920 pounds of unused medications. That's not 1,490 pounds, it's 14,000 pounds in a three year period. Where are those medications coming from? Our medicine cabinets. No one shout out anything, but just think for a moment. What is in your medicine cabinet right now? What does not need to be there? What was the last time you went to the dentist to get a tooth pulled or to have a minor procedure at the dentist or doctor's office and they wrote you a script for 30 painkillers? Get a little bit more into that. I'm going to give you some more data just about the metropolitan area. There were 1.6 million scripts written in Hennepin County in a one-year period. And these scripts are for the opioids. opioids. There were 700,000 scripts in Ramsey County written and 354,000 scripts in Washington County in a one-year period written for these medications. Again, these medications go unused and they get stuck in our medicine cabinets and our young folks, our family, relatives, friends of relatives, friends of friends are coming into our medicine cabinets and taking it. That is one of the reasons why we began to take it to the box program where you can, again, just anonymously drop it off to get these things off the street. And in years gone by, we used to flush them or we throw them in our garbage. And we now know that that is having an effect as well. So those are the things we want to avoid. So please drop them off. And in your packet, you will see there's uh, addresses as to where you can drop these uh, off. And so if you take a moment to do that. Um, what else are we doing as far as the county to combat this problem of medications? Well, I have an individual assigned to the DEA task force. And his sole responsibility is to take these types of drugs off the streets, to investigate doctors whom are over-prescribing these medications, and also Unfortunately, these medications can be obtained through the internet as well. So their responsibility through the DEA task force is to combat that by trying to take these people off the street or trying to divert these things from getting on the street. We also have, and then we also have a violent crime task force and their responsibility is to deal with these street level things as well, individuals who's are, who are selling prescription medications because what we are finding through the individuals whom we are arresting and the individuals whom are in jail and the indiv individuals that we interview, that they go to the road of addiction, often through prescription medication. We continue to deal with heroin as a major problem. And 99% of the individuals whom we talk to about their heroin addiction as they end up in our jail, they got there through prescription medications. And again, when we talk to them, where did they start their fall? Where did they start that a journey to that addiction? That was through the medicine cabinets of family and friends. We also have a Washington County Narcotics Task Force, and you're going to be hearing a little bit from Sergeant 
Benson was the commander of that group, and he'll kind of explain as well of uh, the path of prescription medications. Again, I said partnerships. Uh, you'll hear a lot about partnerships tonight and what we do for that. And uh, partnership that the individuals we have from uh, Know the Truth are here from the Teen Adult Challenge. We spend a lot of time with them, but our major partnership is with the County Attorney's Office as well. And I'll next introduce County Attor Attorney Pete Orpin. As the commander said, I've been in this business for over 31 years. Well, Pete can share how many years he's been in the business. More than that, Pete? Uh, 28. 28. You know, thanks for having me. And you know what? Thanks for coming out. I'm really grateful. And I think all of us are really grateful to see this many folks here. Um, because this is such an important topic. And I sometimes think, why isn't this auditorium full? I mean, this is hitting our community. And that's what I want to talk about. You know, uh, Sheriff Hutton and I do partner up. Our, our uh, officers and prosecutors work closely together. And you know what I've learned? We can work 24 seven and we still got a problem. We can fill the jail and we still got a problem. And we do fill the jail. We're going after these drug dealers. You're gonna hear from Sergeant Benson, he and the drug task force, they're doing everything they can to get the drug dealers out of here. What about the users? Because it seems like we're getting a lot of kids using. Used to be, oh, heroin, that's not my problem. That's down in St. Paul and I moved from there years ago. That's why I came out here. But you know what, it is out here. And we gotta own it, we gotta talk about it, and we gotta come together. And that's why I'm so glad you're here. You know, you can give me 100 more prosecutors and give Bill 200 more cops, and we'll do our thing. It still isn't going to solve the problem. Because we got to come together as a community. We have to come together and say, recognize our kids or our neighbor's kids or some kid down the block we don't even know could be a drug addict. And what are we going to do about that? Well, here's something I want to tell you to do about that, especially for you parents who might find that your kid got stuck on this merry-go-round. You've tried, oh my gosh, have you tried to get him off that merry-go-round? And I don't think you got the power to do it, frankly. And when you do think about surrendering, I'm gonna suggest this. If we really love our kids, we gotta do the right thing for them. And that's real tough love. And the toughest love is when you pick up the phone and you call 911 and you tell our friends at Oakdale PD or the sheriff's office, I found something in my kid's room. I don't know what it is, but I think it's part of the racket he's been running and it might explain some of his or her behavior. And what can I do about it? And we will, the, the police will come out. And they might even arrest your addict son or daughter, especially if they're an adult. What are we gonna do with them? Well, we're not gonna put them in jail or prison, why? Why would we? Put them in a cage for a certain amount of time, you let them out and they're still the junkie they were when they went in. This is an opportunity, folks. This is a real opportunity, and you might need to use it. Don't be afraid to call 911. I can tell you that Sheriff Hutton's a parent. I'm a parent. We're all here parents. Commander Mueller, uh, Sergeant Benson, we're parents too. But what we can do is offer a firmness that I don't know if you can do. And here's the firmness. Our goal is to get that kid into treatment. And you know, we got some incentives. And if they go to treatment and they deal with their addiction, they can come out of this thing without a felony. We can divert them into that program. That's one way of getting them off a merry-go-round. And it's, it's, you know, it sounds serious. Pete, you're telling me to call the police and report my kid? Yeah, I am. If you love them. And you're gonna hear some amazingly poignant stories from some really amazing speakers. I know Lori's here. I, don't, I can't hear it, it's so poignant and so sad. And when you get down to that point, if you think you can talk your kid out of doing drugs when they've fallen in that rabbit hole, no. Nah. You might wanna think about going to Al-Anon for yourself, but when you need to, you can call law enforcement, and I promise you, we're gonna be very fair. We're also gonna be very firm in getting them into treatment and turning their life around. And we got a lot of patience, we do. So that's my message to you folks. I'm looking forward to the great stuff you're gonna to hear tonight. And really, again, thanks for coming out in this weather.
Thank you, Sheriff Hutton, County Attorney Orman. Appreciate that message. Now I'll please introduce Sergeant Mike Benson with Wash County Drug Task Force. Sergeant Benson has been with the Sheriff's Office for 16 years, and he serves as, as a general detective for six, patrol sergeant for three. He's been assigned to Wash County Drug Task Force since January of 2014. Sergeant Benson. Thanks everybody. Uh, again, I'm the current commander of the task force in Washington County. Uh, we currently have members of the Sheriff's Office, um, City of Forest Lake, Woodbury, Cottage Grove, and Bayport on our task force. And we also have a canine partner, Rumble, um, that we utilize as well. <clears throat> I just want to touch on quickly what the Sheriff uh, touched on as far as the opiate problem here um, and the, the uh, journey to uh, heroin addiction. Um, the problem with this is that the drugs that are in your medicine cabinet, what people don't understand is that this stuff is insanely valuable. And once the kids understand that, or they realize that, whether it's at school, they're talking to their friends, social media, whatever, Oxycontin, Vicodin, any of the pills, they're valuable. Somewhere, sometimes up to a dollar per milligram. Upper left hand corner there, that's an 80 milligram pill. Those are, those are valuable. That's why we have the pictures below here with bags of oxys, $100 bills, packets of heroin, marijuana, et cetera, et cetera. What's happening is that the kids are diverting this stuff from the legitimate use that they were prescribed for, paying for you, your uh, loved ones, your grandparents, uh, what have you. Um, once that is taken, they realize that they get high from it or they can make money off it. And then that starts the process. Now if they're taking it, they get high, they run out of this stuff. Now they're addicted to this. If they run out, now what do they do? They can't find it, they go through their medicine cabinet, friends, grandparents can't find it anymore. Heroin will give them the same satisfaction. It'll, it'll help with that, that withdraw sickness that they're feeling. And now all of a sudden, sticking a needle in their arm isn't such a big deal. They didn't wake up one morning and decide to stick a needle in their arm. It started with the medicine cabinets. Hence this graphic. The unassuming dealer on the side, and this is what we end up with. By the time we get called, my unit specifically, we've already, we've got a dead person and we've, we've got to start working the case now. And that's the unfortunate ending. Um, and that's why it's so important with the take it to the box program. If you don't need it, Lock it up. Get it out of the house. We're here to help. Get rid of it. 70% of the prescription medications in the state come from us, family, friends, um, not some dealer lurking in the shadows. These are the addresses. They're in your folders. And what I want to touch on now uh, from the Drug Task Force perspective is trends that we're seeing in schools. Um, this is great to see everybody come out tonight. I really wish we had an opportunity to reach all the parents of all the high school, junior high and high school students and let them know what we're seeing. Because a lot, of the a lot of the parents aren't seeing what we're seeing. First thing is the resurgence of acid. Problem is it's not LSD. Um, what we're seeing now is this new, new, new substance called 25I, 25INBOME, um, 25B, 25C, it's a chemistry class. I had no idea what this stuff was when I took over the task force. I learned in a hurry, and within two weeks of taking over the task force, we had a student overdose in Woodbury and, and die from this substance. Um, it's, um, it's passed around like LSD. It's in foil in the upper right-hand corner. It's blotter paper. They're about a quarter inch square. That's how they're, they're transacted, usually about $10 a, a piece. Um, and the kids can keep those anywhere. Uh, but the giveaway for parents is look for foil or um, candy wrappers. Uh, they're in stuff like that. If you touch it, it will get absorbed through your skin. So if you do find it, just call the police. We'll come out. We'll take it off your hands and uh, get it away from the kids. It's synthetic. It's made in China primarily. It's available on the internet if they know where to find it. And we're finding it more and more on search warrants. Um, marijuana, obviously, is still a problem. It's the, uh, the, it's the number one um, drug that we're dealing with uh, in the schools. 
and it's opening up the, uh, the door to the newest trend that we're seeing is butane hash oil. It goes by a couple different names, wax, honey oil, dabs, shatter. Um, it's, it's the new big thing in the schools. And the, if, if you're a parent and you've never heard of this stuff or you've never seen it, if you don't do another thing after our, our presentation tonight, I want you to go home, get on the internet and just type this in. Watch the videos on YouTube. It'll show you how they make it. It'll show you how they smoke it. Uh, this stuff, you can smoke this stuff in vaping pens or e-cigarettes. And if you ask the kids now and you talk to the SROs in the schools, vaping pens and e-cigarettes are very popular. They're not allowed, but the students have them. They're getting confiscated all the time. As parents, you need to know that yeah, my kid has a vaping pen, or my kid, yeah, he smokes those e-cigarettes, and what am I gonna do? If they have the, the, the butane hash oil, they can smoke that in these vaping pens, take them apart, put it back together, smoke the uh, butane hash oil. As the, as the device is meant to be used, whether they got bubblegum flavored oil in it or whatever, that's what you're gonna smell. You're not gonna smell the, the butane hash oil, which they're getting now uh, up to 80% hit of THC. Not the 15% that they're gonna get from smoking a joint. So this is the new big up and coming thing that we're seeing now in the schools and uh, it's concerning. This is a recent seizure that we had um, at the task force. The upper left hand corner is this butane hash oil. Each one of those sheets, that's two, is about the size of a hardcover book. We got four of those. Um, the, the substance below it is MDMA, ecstasy. Um, they were breaking that down, putting it in capsules to the right there. Upper right hand corner is the, uh, the 2,5-I substance. And then even uh, this kid went out and got cocaine, so he had everything. And this kid was selling to high school students in Woodbury, Oakdale, Cottage Grove. And uh, thousands, thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars we, we seized from this individual. Money that the kids in the schools were spending on this stuff right here. Last thing is Rumble. This is our canine. Um, this is her with uh, a recent seizure. The uh, reason I put her up there and to uh, kind of touch on what both Sheriff Hutton and uh, County Attorney Orpa talked about. We want to help you as parents help your kids uh, before it's too late, before they go down that road. Um, if you suspect that they're using a substance, um, marijuana is an easy one because you can tell if they've been smoking it. Um, the hash oil, that's a little tougher. But if you have uh, any idea that they may have, they're hiding stuff in the house, um, their bedroom, the basement, in a uh, storage facility or a storage garage outside or a shed, um, call us. Uh, I will send a handler out there with Rumble. She doesn't bite, she actually smiles. Um, she's passive alerting, she won't wreck anything, she'll just walk around and she'll sit down when she smells something. And then you're free to come in and find out what it is and then whatever we find we will take we're not interested in taking your kid to jail um, all this pro marijuana stuff the arguments they're saying that we're locking all these people up for joints whatever it's not true we want to get your kids the help that they need so um, call me call the PDs um, that's my phone number That'll ring at my desk if you have any questions at all about trends, um, about anything that's going on in the schools, the community. Um, give me a call. I'll tell you what I know, and if I don't have the answer, I'll have it to you in 30 minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Sarge. Appreciate it. Um, as a former task force commander, what I can tell you is uh, Mike and his group do an amazing job, and their focus isn't just enforcement, but, but prevention and education as well, and they spend a lot of time, and we are different than any other task force throughout the state 
in terms of what we deal with. If a citizen has a call of a neighbor that might be selling one joint, our task force will address that issue. And you can contact us at any time, up to what you hear the sergeant talking about, dealing with the actual cartels that are in our community. Now I'm uh, fortunate to uh, introduce Officer Tom Higgins, who's a school resource officer here at Tartan. He's also responsible for the other schools within the area as well. So you heard from uh, Sergeant Benson on the task force perspective. Now you're going to hear a local perspective. And again, you're very lucky to have him as your school resource officer. He's been with Oakdale Police Department for 27 years. Uh, other assignments such as investigations and SWAT. And he's been the uh, school resource officer here for three years. So please welcome Officer Higgins. Thank you. Yeah, I've, uh, I've been here at Tartan for three years and you know, we've, are by far, our, our biggest issue is marijuana and alcohol. We've heard about uh, um, a lot of the other drugs. Uh, thankfully, the, the kids aren't bringing them into the school at this point. Doesn't mean they're not using them on the weekends. Uh, it just means that they're, so far we haven't found any in the school. Um, as he said, I'm a, I'm a school resource officer, and the part of it is resource. I, I, I am a resource for, for you as parents. Uh, I'm working for you as parents uh, just as much as I'm working for the school and I'm working for the uh, Yorkdale Police Department. I answer every phone call I get. I answer every email I get. If you have a question as a parent, if you have a concern as a parent uh, regarding your son or daughter, please call. Uh, if I don't have the answer, I will be more than happy to find it for you. Uh, I, uh, I will work with you. I will help you. Uh, I would much rather know your son or daughter uh, by having them come in and talk to them and deal with them than having to come down where, where we're finding, finding drugs on them and, and, and things are, are going bad that way and it's, it's too late. I would, my biggest fear is someday uh, Finding a, a student in the bathroom that's overdosed on a drug. I, I really, it, it, that's one of my biggest fears because if we don't, if I don't know about it, if I don't know that uh, one of the kids are having a problem, I can't do anything about it until I, I just, all I can do is react to, to a problem. So please call. Uh, I will be more than willing to help you. I will be more than willing to, to put you in touch with any resources that I can find. Uh, so please do that. Uh, <clears throat> we do have drug counselors uh, at, at Tartan and at North, uh, and, and if you, if you uh, suspect that your son or daughter is using or has used, uh, maybe over the weekend or something like that, they have drug kits, uh, urine kits that they, uh, you can come in and, uh, and they, can, they can use, a, use one of the urine kits. Uh, Ellie McCarty is our, uh, our drug counselor and she, uh, um, she can certainly help out with that too. So. Don't hesitate about that. Like I say, I can I can certainly get you in touch with her if um, if you don't haven't been able to get a hold of her. Um, I just like I say, I uh, uh, the kids the kids at Tartan, uh, you know, a day in the, a day in the life of a SRO at Tartan is uh, is mainly uh, I I talk to kids all the, all day long. I talk to them about a variety of things. We we deal with. Uh, thefts and that kind of thing, and we also have the, the, the marijuana and the, and the alcohol issues. Not as often as you might think, but it's, uh, it's still there. Um, just once again, all I want to do is make sure that you understand that you can call me at any time. Uh, I will be more than happy to help you out. And that, now you heard from the, the law enforcement side of this. Um, now I want you to introduce uh, Rob, who's uh, somebody that's, that's actually gone through this himself. Can you please welcome Rob? Hey everybody, my name is Rob. Uh, my story starts off in Chicago, Illinois. I was born there to a very poor home, very humble beginnings, and I uh, had four older brothers, so with uh, one of my older brothers who was involved with gangs, and he ended up catching a murder charge, which sent uh, my mom into a tirade, which she was like, well, I don't want the same fate for the younger boys, so she took me and my second oldest brother, our second youngest brother besides me, to Minnesota, um, fearing the same fate for us. Coming to Minnesota, my mom had her own um, addiction problems. My mom was a severe alcoholic. Um, I was her fifth kid, but she honestly didn't know how to raise any of them from the beginning. Uh, pretty much didn't. So uh, with no father in the picture and just having my mom there, who wasn't even there, she was just drunk, 
Uh, me and my brother hung out a lot. Um, everything my brother did, I wanted to do. Whether that was good, bad, happy, or sad, me and my brother, we did it together. So um, at home, I was very angry you know, about everything that happened in my life. So I would go to school and I would take it out on kids at school. I was pretty much a bully for elementary, middle, and high school, all of them. Um, well liked by the people I wanted to be liked by, but pretty much hated by everybody else, teachers and stuff like that. I, uh, I found drugs early on because my brother had done drugs, and like I said, everything he did, I did. So when he was doing drugs at 13, 14, experimenting, I was doing them at 10, 11, 12, you know, because that's what my brother was doing, that's what I wanted to do. And uh, instantly fell in love with it, loved the way it made me feel. Alcohol was the main one. Uh, when I did alcohol, it just numbed everything, made me forget about everything. And, um, eventually that made me legal troubles. I ended up, um, I had about six felonies by the time I was 16 years old. Uh, my legal problems ended up catching up to me. I did a year in juvenile detention center. But um, I could just say that alcohol was um, my best friend. It was when I went to juvie, I lost my girlfriend, I lost all my friends. But when I got out, it was still sitting there, alcohol was. So it was really easy just to fall back in that same pattern. And uh, I ended up hitting the Started partying again when I got out of juvie, didn't care. Got into more legal trouble as an adult. Caught two more felonies, as I said before you here as an adult. And I um, was looking at some prison time. And uh, all my PO really said was, all you have to do is listen to what I say, and you're not gonna get in trouble, you know, we'll put this over your head and we'll forget about it. Well, I couldn't stop drinking, as the story keeps saying, you know? And uh, I kept drinking, kept failing UA after UA. And, um, I violated my probation out to one of my probation officers and they sent me to prison. He's like, I've had enough with you. And I said, you know, just give me this one more chance. Let me go to Teen Challenge, where actually my brother had graduated from this program. He's doing really well now. I just said, let me, let me, let me get this shot, you know, and, and he did. But I was just saying, uh, so here, I'm, I'm doing good now. I've been in this program for about 10 months, and I'm 10 months sober and doing big things. You know, I'm going to get married. I have a very active in my daughter's life, and we just moved into a new home. And, but I just want to say, like, as, a, as an addict of growing up, my mother, that, you know, my mother had gotten sober halfway through my life, and she thought because she got sober that I forgot about all of the things that had happened while she was still using. So when I was 12, she got sober, and like I just, okay, that erases the 12 years of abuse, physically, mentally, all that. So I should just be happy that I have a mom again. Well, that's not how it works. You don't forget. You don't forget any of the stuff that happened. And um, so she would pretty much throw money at me when I was like, you know, I'll, I'll leave you alone if you give me some money. So that's, that would help enable me enabled me to use and you know pretty much just not wanting to be home you know it's just if I could say anything it's just like giving the money to kids um, these days is like so just like yeah you know you kind of trust them and they think don't be crazy you know don't go through my phone or don't pop in on me or whatever like that's what needs to happen because I can honestly say if my mom would have given two craps to just pop in and check on me to just check ask for a receipt where I was spending some money something like that I can honestly say that it would not have escalated as far as it did, and I wouldn't be standing before you with a 12-year addict at, 12, at 23 years old. So uh, with that being said, just uh, be mindful of that. And the older siblings, too, um, if there are any in here, adults that have multiple kids, the, the older sibling is the ringleader, <laughs> okay? They, they have control of everything, the whole situation. And I just know that my brother, I mean, everything he did, I wanted to do. And they have a big influence, whether they won't admit it, whether they fight all the time. You know, whatever they do, it really all comes down to that. So getting that first one right, you know, it's, <laughs> it's going to do a lot. So I just wanted to leave you guys with that. And with that, I'd like to introduce the director of this program that I'm in, Know the Truth, Adam Peterson. Good evening. Thank you so much, Rob. Can we give Rob another hand for sharing this story? Um, my name is Adam Peterson with uh, Minnesota Adult and Teen Challenge and the Know the Truth Substance Abuse Prevention Program. And we're so excited uh, to be here tonight with you. Uh, this is our fifth event that we've done with Washington County. Uh, we did two events back in uh, December, and we've done three in the last three weeks. Um, this is the third event. And so thank you so much for coming, taking time out of your busy schedule to be here on this important issue. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, 
Um, and as we're going to teach them to know the truth and what we do in the schools and kind of go through some of that data before I introduce our next speaker. Um, Minnesota Adult Teen Challenge is a drug and alcohol treatment recovery program. It is short term and long term inpatient and outpatient services for teens and adults. We've got 13 year olds in our program, we've got 75 year olds in our program. We have a licensed Rule 31 program called Life for Renewal, anywhere from 7 to 90 days depending on client need. And then we have a long term program. That program that Rob is in, 12 to 15 months. Mainly people come in with drug and alcohol addiction, but there's a lot of other underlying issues. Eating disorders, cutting, depression, abuse, all those types of things uh, we deal with as a program. We've worked in the state of Minnesota for 30 years uh, treating addiction. In 2006, we saw a need to try to prevent addiction. Um, as you heard, uh, County Attorney Pete Orkut say, we would love to um, be out of a job. Well, technically, I wouldn't be because we're prevention, but um, treatment. We would love to be able to get people to realize that they don't want to go down the path of drugs and alcohol, that the impact it has on themselves and their family. But we know that with the society we live in, the pressures, media, the influence um, that our kids face, um, prescription medication, all these types of things, uh, we're fighting an uphill battle. And that's why it's so important that you're here and that we have partnerships like this, because we need to do this together. Know the Truth goes into high schools and middle schools. We're very active in Washington County. We've been coming to Tartan for years, and we speak to the students about the risks of using and abusing drugs and alcohol. We actually bring in young people like Rob to share their personal stories of addiction to hopefully help prevent future stories of addiction. Um, as a program, uh, we really focus on um, the gateway drugs. So we heard about all the drugs from um, Sergeant Mike Benson and um, mainly focusing on cigarettes, alcohol, and marijuana. And uh, talking about prescription pills as well as a gateway drug, we heard how that can happen. Um, Oxycontin is known as a synthetic heroin. How many people are familiar with a pill called Adderall? What you might not know about Adderall is it's actually a Schedule II drug. The chemical makeup of Adderall is an amphetamine salt. Any amount of Adderall could be a felony drug charge. It's known as a prescription dose of methamphetamine. Very simple. Um, here's uh, an interesting stat. In the United States, um, we have less than 5% of the world's population. We consume over 75% of the world's prescription pills. Less than 5% of the population, more than right around 75%. And when you break that down with Adderall, we consume over 80% of the world's Adderall. We've got an overprescribing problem um, in our society. And we'll talk about what we can do to help curb that. Um, and when we talk to the students, we really focus on uh, misconceptions. The misconception that everyone drinks in high school. Over 50% of kids will never drink in high school. But kids hear kids talk about how drunk they got. Kids don't hear kids talk about how sober they got, right? So these are the kinds of things we really encourage students to think about. Look past the one or five people in your school that are talking about how drunk they got and think about the hundreds of other kids that are doing other activities and not partying on the weekends. And also when it comes to uh, marijuana, um, a big excuse is it's just a plant. It can't be harmful. Well, all these drugs we're talking about come from plants. Heroin comes from a plant. Tobacco, alcohol, cocaine, hallucinogenic drugs. And so just because something's a plant doesn't mean it can't be harmful. And with prescription pills, just because something comes from a doctor doesn't mean it can't be abused. Uh, this is an interesting study. The top 12 reasons why some a teen would use prescription medication. Um, I, bold, I put a couple in bold, and uh, one is easy to get. The number one, easy to get from my parents' emergency cabinet. This is preventable, you guys. Easy to get through other people's prescriptions. Perceived as safer. And the very bottom one, parents don't care as much if I get caught. So what are we seeing in Washington County in the schools? Primarily, um, marijuana use. So 38% of students surveyed have abused illegal drugs. Of those users, want to be clear, of those users, 98% with the marijuana, 32% with the prescription pills. Uh, we're, we weren't saying why. The, no, the number we normally see uh, with prescription pills is right around 21%. So we've definitely got an issue with the Washington County with prescription medication. 57% of students reported they consumed alcohol. 
18% of them drink three or more times a month. The reason why we show that is that it's not just a one-time thing, it shows a repeated behavior. Um, and then 35% of males, 48% of females fall into the class of binge drinking. And we know the consequences that can come from binge drinking. Here's a chart to kind of show of the schools we work with in Washington County. You can see part of um, towards the bottom there, 24% illegal drug use as it compares to others, uh, the statewide 28%. So here is the good. This is why I'm excited you guys are here, and this is why I'm excited these guys are here. Um, top two reasons why kids in Washington County don't want to use drugs or alcohol or won't abuse drugs. One, uh, they don't want to run into these guys. I don't know why, these are some of the most attractive people in this room, aren't they? I love, I want to have dinner with all of them. Um, so, but they don't want to get arrested. Now, how many of you, if you could, just by a show of hands, how many of you, after the first couple speakers, have a different perspective of your law enforcement here in Washington County, and what they're here for? Terrific. And we know that that is positive. That how they want to help, they want you to call them, they want to be there uh, for you. Number two, parents' disapproval. No matter how many times they say you ruin their life, they don't want to talk to you, they wish they had other parents, right? We know kids say things like this. They care what you think. They value your opinion. And so that's really important. Here are a couple other slides uh, in regards to um, some things in Washington County. This uh, study is, was done by the Washington County Public Health and Environment. We see by grade the use of prescription medication, male and female. Um, ninth grade is a big one there. And then here's the numbers in regards to drugs and alcohol across the board. Alcohol we see is the big issue, marijuana, and then the prescription pills, the Ritalin, Adderall, Concerta, and then the painkillers, and then over-the-counter medication too. Where when we talk about locking up medication, we're not just talking about the opiates. Uh, Robotussin is used, it's called robotripping, triple C's, coursing, cough and cold. Kids are using over-the-counter medication to get high. And so we need to be aware of these things that are going on. All right, our next speaker is Bailey. She's gonna come forward and share her story. Like I said, this is the fifth event we've done, the third in the last three weeks. Uh, we were in Woodbury two weeks ago. Um, a parent from Woodbury, they talked about his daughter earlier. Unfortunately, she overdosed and died off that uh, synthetic drug. Um, and Tom Fitzgerald shared his story in Woodbury. Bailey shared her story as well that evening. She was a graduate of Woodbury High School, and she's gonna share her story uh, with you now. Let's please welcome Bailey. Hi everyone. Oh, hi everyone. Um, thanks for coming out tonight. So, like Adam said, my name is Bailey. I'm 27, and I graduated from Woodbury High School in 06. Um, and I guess I'll just start at the beginning. I had um, a great childhood. I had everything I needed. Um, my dad was an alcoholic, um, but I, he came home one night driving drunk with me in the car, and I think it was around the age I was six. And my mom gave him the ultimatum to get help or um, get out and he chose to get help and he had some lapses throughout my childhood but for the most part it was good and um, I just have always been genetically predisposed because addiction is all over my family and since I can remember just being a little girl I just suffered from anxiety like even going to concessions with my sister um, I'd make her go order me a Snickers instead of going to talk to people because I just had social anxiety so around 15 um, when I started experimenting with drugs, it was weed and cigarettes. Um, it just, it, it, I didn't start using every day. Um, but it was in high school, I played sports and I think at 16 years old was the first time I drank and it was with all my softball girlfriends. So I didn't think it was, you know, a big deal because it was all of my good friends that were doing it. Um, and um, things progressed from there, it was just, you know, experimenting here and then on the weekends. It was all my friends that were getting good grades and playing sports, so I didn't think it was that big of a deal. Um, but the choices of partying on the weekends led to, when I was 18, um, I found out I was pregnant. And so I actually forged my mom's signature and skipped high school one day, and I went and had an abortion. Um, and so from that point forward, I just didn't even know how to deal with it. And I just started, um, I felt really, Shamed. I had a lot of self-hatred and 
just kind of spiraled into a pit of anxiety and depression and um, started using a lot more and it was just a lot of cocaine and opiates and benzos and alcohol, just kind of everything I could get my hands on. Um, and so, and then like about three months after that, I had tried committing suicide and like my abortion, I just wanted to stuff it and um, no one knew I had done that, none of my friends or anything. And then my mom, um, we never really talked about it again. I um, was still using a lot, but I ended up graduating high school with honors um, and I went on to go to Winona State and there I just kept making um, poor choices, hanging out with the wrong people, and um, my whole thing was I, I kind of always lived a double life. I thought, well, I'm going to class, even though you know I'd go to class drunk or on ecstasy and stuff, and I'm getting good grades, so it's not an issue. Um, but it definitely was, and the more poor choices I made, the more shame that came with all that. Um, and I was when I was 20, I got my first DUI, and I went to outpatient and was sober for about a month, went back to Winona and started using again. Um, but you know, at Winona there was, um, you know, I had overdosed and I, at 22 after I graduated, I got my second DUI, just all these consequences and I was just kind of out of control and my parents were trying everything to get me to stop. Um, but nothing they said really um, hit home and I wouldn't listen. Um, but uh, after I graduated from college, I was in corporate sales for about three years, and um, it was there where I, um, after my second DUI, I stopped drinking for about six months, and I started using opiates a lot more. And so, um, like, I, I don't know how they had mentioned, they become really addictive. So it started off, you know, on the weekends, and then it was at night, and then it was like, wow, okay, I should take this in the morning before work, and I won't have to feel withdrawal-y all day, so. I'll just, you know, it became, it got to the point where I would just take, you know, my eight Percocet in the morning before work instead of coffee. Um, and things just spiraled from there. And um, about two years ago, my dad um, died from cancer and I had experimented with heroin in the past and I went from pills to heroin again and I was just u eventually using heroin and crack every day and I knew I needed help so I did check into treatment and. Um, it didn't stick, I was sober for about four months and ended up relapsing and things. They say when you relapse, you're gonna end up where you are or even worse, and I definitely did. I ended up trying meth and I started using needles and um, I was just in a toxic relationship and that's when I knew I needed help, so I got into Teen Challenge to start working on the underlying issues, you know, my anxiety, the abortion, um, an ex that introduced me to heroin and opiates at Winona State, he had actually overdosed and died and I think I, cried about it one night and had never really thought about it again, but just dealing with all those things. And I will say as um, the police team had mentioned, um, just you know, calling them and stuff, and that's true, and that's the one thing that my mom, I think it was probably really hard for her, but just st stop enabling, and not letting me come home when I don't have a place to stay and I'm breaking up with my boyfriend because he's using and whatnot, and just kind of putting her foot down. And as Rob mentioned too, I have a younger sister and um, she actually knew Ryan they went to treatment together. And so, Lori and your family, I just wanna say I'm so sorry, my condolences go out to you. And, you know, um, we had talked earlier, but my sister, she's still using, and um, it's hard, so I'm sorry, and I hope things, you know, get better. And um, yeah, with that being said, that's my story. Warning signs, some things to look for. We've heard some great things in Rob's story and Bailey's story. Um, they're going to be available during the Q&A time for any questions in regards to maybe um, how they hit their drugs or how they hit their addiction from their families. Um, family history of addiction, Bailey hit, it, hit this right on the uh, head with um, the predisposition. We know that just because your dad's neck doesn't mean you're going to be, but we know that the environment plays a huge role. What you grow up seeing, if you grow up seeing your parents uh, drink every night after work, that's what is normal. Um, and we know that actions speak louder than words. Um, and so it's really important to not only uh, teach them correct behavior, but to model correct behavior as well. Um, another big uh, warning sign is abuse, neglect, traumatic uh, childhood experience. Um, we can't have a conversation about addiction, uh, chemical dependency, 
um, mental health without talking about trauma. And we are talking about all trauma. We know that um, abuse or um, sexual abuse or those types of things, we know those are traumatic. Um, but trauma isn't always that top tier level of trauma. Trauma can be your parents getting a divorce and mom is talking about how bad dad is, dad's talking about how, mom, how bad mom is, and you're stuck in the middle thinking it's all your fault. That's traumatic. Losing a friend, losing a family, having a, um, a brother, losing a brother, losing a sister, uh, a grandparent, moving, uh, losing friends, changing schools. These are traumatic experiences uh, for our youth, and we need to be aware of these things and what's going on during that time frame. Um, Here's a few other uh, warning signs and Chris Marlowe and Monty. Uh, Rob did a great job of explaining this. We had someone else uh, one day on the stage um, say, if my parents would have asked for a receipt, uh, said to check with law enforcement, the last time I checked, drug dealers don't give receipts, right? And so um, if you're giving them a lot of cash, um, you have no way of tracking what that money's going for. If your kid's going bowling every Friday night, and you guys decide they're asking for 20 bucks every Friday night to go bowling, and you guys go on a family outing, and you think your child loves bowling, and they bowl like a 40? Chances are they haven't been bowling, right? And it's important to be aware of some of this stuff. So giving them a, um, asking for receipts, or you can get a preloaded credit card where you can check where they're using uh, that, that money. Changes in schoolwork, increased secrecy about possessions. Um, a lot of times, if they're using on a regular basis, uh, they're, they're thinking about they don't want to get caught. So they're smart. Individuals that use drugs and alcohol are very smart, and um, they're not going to maybe leave their drugs in their room. They're going to keep it on them at all times. Or maybe if they're always carrying a backpack, they're not letting that backpack out of their sight, that could be a one sign. Uh, missing prescription drugs, obviously, Weight loss or some interest in losing weight, those stimulants, Ritalin, Adderall, and Serta, those are known as uh, drugs that suppress appetites, and so help people lose weight. Uh, bottles of eye drops, the mass bloodshot eyes, things along those lines. And there's no one sign of, um, you know, this person's going to be an addict. There's a lot of different pressures, a lot of different reasons why. Um, Self-medication is a big one, especially with prescription pills. Um, Adderall is known as a study drug, and uh, that's a big reason. Really, prescription pills have definitely changed the face of our addict. It's not necessarily someone that's struggling in school, failing out, getting in trouble. Um, a lot of times, this is honorable. We just heard this in Billy's story. Um, kids that are in sports that have an injury, they're trying to bounce back to impress the scouts, and so they're going to take Oxycontin or Percocet to, um, to play through the pain. These are uh, prescription pills, and the big thing is, and Bill kind of hit on this, is they're highly addictive. With opiate medication, just taking as prescribed, you can develop a dependence within eight days. Easy access um, as well. Oh, I'm going to move the slides. And so these are just a few of the warning signs. We're going to have an opportunity to hear more through the Q&A time um, as well and really get to the questions that you have. Um, next, I would like to introduce our next speaker. And um, I am so, uh, it, I'm torn because I'm excited for Lori to share a story, um, but it's a tough one. Uh, I had the chance, opportunity to meet Lori a few months ago, um, and a little background, these forums, we've been doing these forums, we've been working with counties for the last year and a half doing these forums. We were in Anoka County about a year and a half ago, um, and there was a mom that shared her story about her son that had overdosed and died from heroin. And she shared it three times in these forums with us. And she was in a support group. And it just so happened that she met Lori and shared about her sharing her story. And so Lori started reaching out to Washington County. Lori reached out to us and said, I want to share my family's story. This is important. People need to know. And so Lori has been incredible. Thank you so much um, for your willingness to open up and be vulnerable and be honest with us. Let's please welcome Lori Lewis as she comes to us. Good evening. Some of you here tonight may know me and my family. You may be a teacher here at Tartan and you've had my kids in class. My husband may have coached your kids in sports and your kids may be friends with my friends, or with my kids. We may be friends, neighbors, co-workers. 
We've chaperoned school events together and shared stories at numerous sporting events. Never would I have thought that I would be sharing Ryan's story with you tonight. But my husband and I, along with our children, feel that if we can help one family or individual, then we'll share. On July 10th of this past year, my son Ryan died of heroin overdose. He struggled with the disease of addiction for a year to a year and a half, an addiction that began with opiates and moved to heroin. The progression was rapid. I'd like to briefly share Ryan's story, our story, in hopes that it brings more awareness to our communities, that this wicked drug heroin, as well as other opiates, are in our communities. There's no town that hasn't been affected by heroin, and our loved ones are using this, and they're dying. This can happen to any one of us. It can start by using pain meds for a single or a simple dental or medical procedure or with recreational use of pain meds, and it can easily and quickly lead to addiction. These drugs are just a tweet, a text, a Snapchat away, and they can be delivered right to your door at any time of the day or night. Ryan was the oldest of our four children just 23 years old. And in fact, two weeks ago on March 25th, it was his birthday. It's just another of the many firsts that we go through without him. If you ask anybody to describe Ryan, they would tell you that he was intelligent, artistic, creative, energetic, and had a goofy sense of humor and a passion for music. He was so much fun to be around. Ryan excelled in music, art, and photography, and he was most content when he was playing guitar, painting, drawing, or taking pictures. Ryan had so much to offer. Ryan's substance use began toward the end of his junior year here at Tartan. We had suspected that he had been smoking pot, and this assumption proved to be right. At that time, Ryan entered a 30-day outpatient treatment at New Connections. He attended school and treatment during the day. After the 30 days, he returned to Tartan his junior year. He graduated in 2009, and the next few years were uneventful. In December of 2012, Ryan's girlfriend called. They had been living together for about a year. She stated that he was feeling a little depressed and that she was worried about him. Ryan then called, stating that nothing was going right, and he just wanted to end everything, and nothing was worth anything anymore. I immediately drove over and realized that the situation was not good. I convinced him to go to the ER. It was during this ER visit that we learned that Ryan had opioids and benzos in his system. He had anxiety, so the benzos I understood. But the opioids, where did he get them from? The opioids, one of the places he got them from was from me. I had had back surgery a year earlier, and he had taken the leftover pain meds. We did not have them locked up. Why didn't we? we? These meds can kill. Guns can kill. We keep those locked up. I didn't think about it. I didn't think we had to worry. Not my kid, not my family. How could this have happened? We addressed the issues with Ryan, and he had told us he had not been happy about many things and that there were financial issues, and he asked if he and his girlfriend, girlfriend could move in for a couple of months, and we agreed. Within the month, they had moved in. Things were a little rocky, as there were rules to follow, as we had other kids in the house that had to get up for school, we had to get up for work, just the normal rules. In the months that followed, Ryan seemed to get angry and irritated more easily. It was hard to even have a conversation with him. Again, we had questioned the substance use, and he had denied. I had also noticed that he was often ill with flu-like symptoms in the morning that seemed to have disappeared throughout the day but I never was able to put my finger on it and put all these pieces together with these withdrawal symptoms. How could I miss this? And I'm a nurse. I don't know. Again, I would ask him all kinds of questions. How could you be so ill in the morning, feeling better in the afternoon, and no one gets better this quickly? Ryan finally got tired of all the questions from, from us as well as his girlfriend, and he moved out, and they broke up. It was difficult for us because we had no way to know what was going on. One day, Ryan had brought his clothes over to do some wash. I thought it would be nice and start the wash for him. I went to go grab the items out of the wash to put them in the dryer, and I felt something in one of his socks. I reached in and pulled out a needle. 
I didn't get it. Why was this in his sock? I called Ryan, but there was no answer. I called his girlfriend and asked her if she knew anything about this. She had actually been talking to his roommate and friend that morning, and he had told me he had been acting strange and that they actually did suspect that Ryan was using heroin. How could this be? I didn't understand. This was the kid who cried up until the time he was 17 to get a flu shot every year. How could he be using IV drugs? We couldn't wrap our heads around this, but we knew we had to get him help. We moved Ryan back in to our home and made a trip to the ER. The ChemDep counselor mentioned inpatient treatment for Ryan, and yet there were no beds available in the Twin City area. No beds. They were all full. So we brought him home, helped him through his withdrawal symptoms, and literally watched him the entire weekend, 24 hours a day. We didn't let him out of our sight, and it was exhausting. On Monday, we got him into St. John's intensive care outpatient treatment, along with AE meetings several times a week. During the second week of outpatient treatment, we got a call that Ryan was in the ER. He was having withdrawal symptoms, which meant he had been using during treatment. St. John's again recommended inpatient treatment and would not accept him back in outpatient because of the drug use. My husband and I at that time were not on the same page about the recommendation. I wanted Ryan to be admitted, and my husband and Ryan felt that we could get together or through this together with AA meetings, counseling, and outpatient treatment at Canvas. And so we went this route for a while, had random UAs done, and had him check in with us multiple times a day. This did work for a few weeks, and then again Ryan relapsed. At this point, I could not stand by and watch this anymore, and I contacted the counselors at St. John's and asked for help. Because it was on a Friday, our only option was to bring him back into the ER and put a 72-hour hold on him. We just did not want to do this, and instead stayed home again the entire weekend and watched Ryan round the clock. He went everywhere with us. He slept in the same bedroom with us. We stood outside an open bathroom door. On Monday, we got him in for a chem-dep assessment, and after many hours and much red tape, there was a bed open, and we were able to have Ryan admitted to Hazleton in Plymouth. By now, it was early October. Our son was safe for the time being and we were exhausted. During this time, all of our focus was on Ryan and keeping him safe and in recovery. Our other three children lacked our attention. What they did receive was a little bit that we had left over, and most of the time that wasn't much. We didn't have the patience for even the smallest of their needs. And there were times when I would lie down in bed at the end of the night and ask my husband if the other kids were even home in bed. This disease affects the entire family, and it's so very isolating. During Ryan's first day at Hazleton, we all attended a four-day parent and sibling program, and we learned much about this disease. After the 28 days at Hazleton, Ryan had gained 23 pounds, was back to his old self, and was again full of life and fun and in recovery. Within the week, he had relapsed. In fact, we would later find out that he had used the same night that he came home. So back he went for another 14-day stay. This time, Hazleton Center City had an opening and they felt it would be better for him to be with adults. After that discharge, Ryan had been for, in recovery for approximately five weeks when I received a call from my daughter stating that her car wouldn't start and she had to get to work. I told her to go downstairs and see if Ryan was home and see if he could give her a ride. Within minutes, she had called back frantic. She was talking to me on one line and 911 on the other. Ryan had overdosed. She had found him unresponsive, blue, and barely breathing. He was brought to Regions ER, where I met them there. As I sat in the room with Ryan, reminding him to breathe every time the cardiac alarm went off, I just cried. I felt so hopeless and helpless. How do I help my son? What was his rock bottom? Because I had definitely hit mine. When his dad got to the ER, we talked to the doctors, nurses, and counselors and asked them what we could do. And they told us to tell him he could not come home and he needed to find his own ride home and a place to stay as we were doing nothing but enabling him and we weren't helping. To hear this is hard because as a parent, it goes against everything you know and do. But we told them all of this and we left. This was unbearable, but we went home, packed a bag for him, and left it by the front door. Ryan showed up at home and thought he was going to stay. It was hard to stick to our guns and tell him that he had, we had a suitcase ready and he needed to find a place to stay. 
He left that night, and if you remember, a year ago in January, it was bitter cold. Neither my husband or I slept that night, wondering if he was safe. Ryan called a day or two later and asked if he could come home. Our terms were that he could, but it required treatment, and Ryan reluctantly agreed. Again, we felt relieved that Ryan was in treatment and that he was safe. Ryan was in recovery for longer this time. The recovery times were longer, but the relapses were more severe. During recovery, Ryan and his girlfriend had gotten back together. He was hanging out with his friends again, having fun with his siblings, making music, drawing, painting, and laughing. Our Ryan was back. It was good to see this. After discharge, he was attending intensive outpatient treatment at Hazleton in St. Paul and going to AA meetings and doing what he was supposed to do. Ryan so very much wanted to get better. When I asked him what was so hard and what I could do to help, he just said, Mom, the physical and psychological cravings are just unbearable at times. And this was even when he was on the monthly Vivitol in injections that are supposed to help reduce cravings. It was around the end of May when I suspected Ryan had been using again and we confronted him. He had been slipping on his meetings and did not want to continue attending day treatment. And we were right. As parents, we were at our wit's end exhausted and in need of help for our son. Again, he went back into Hazleton at the beginning of June. This time we told Ryan that what we were doing at home was not working and on the advice of his counselors, he would need to move into a sober house when he discharged. He was extremely angry with, at both of us and didn't talk to us for about a week. When he and my husband did talk one night, Ryan said, Dan, am I ever gonna get better? And Monty said, yeah, we're going to get through this together, buddy. We can do it. On Monday, July 7th, my husband picked him up from Hazleton and helped him move into a sober house in St. Paul. He was still very angry with us about the situation and decided not to talk to us that day or night. So we gave him time, and on Tuesday, he called. On Wednesday, I went to go pick Ryan up after work, brought him some clothes and bedding, and we went grocery shopping. We talked about how things are going to be and made plans for the next day. I gave him a hug and a kiss and told him I loved him and how good he looked. On Thursday afternoon at 12.30 p.m., I received a call from a man who identified himself as a St. Paul police officer and asked if he'd come to, come to my work and talk to me. Why do you need to come to my work and talk to me? What's going on? Why can't you just do this over the phone? My mind started racing. I thought, where's my husband? Where are my kids? Where's Ryan? It couldn't be Ryan. He's in a sober house. He's safe. I then just asked him if it had anything to do with my kids to please just tell me. He then told me that my son, Ryan, had overdosed that morning. Well, what did this mean? Ryan had overdosed before. I asked him again, not wanting to hear the answer. He then told me that my son was dead. He had died that morning of a heroin overdose. And I remember just screaming no over and over and over again, because this is not how it was supposed to be. He was supposed to be in the sober house, in recovery, and safe. We were supposed to work through this together. The officer met me at my car. They told me they had already talked to my husband and gave me as many details as they could at that time. On the way home, I was in shock. My phone rang and rang with my husband trying to reach me, but I just could not talk to him and hear his voice. This wasn't the way it was supposed to be. Ryan was supposed to be in recovery, get the job of his life, marry the love of his life, and celebrate all of those first. He was robbed, and we were robbed. And there is such a void in our lives now. We miss him terribly. As parents, we feel that we failed. We could not protect Ryan. I keep telling myself that there has to be a purpose in Ryan's death and all of our suffering, but I just don't know what that is yet. What I do know and what you've heard tonight is the face of addiction has changed. It can be any one of us. No longer can we say this will never happen to me because it can and it does. No one chooses to become addicted. The person chooses to use that first time and that drug chooses them. We as a community can recognize this, educate ourselves, and support people that suffer from this disease just like we support someone who has diabetes or cancer or any other many chronic diseases. 
This brief period in my son's life was not what defined him. Ryan will always be remembered as the funny, talented, creative soul that he was, and he would have done great things. Thank you.
They don't. <laughs> they don't. They don't have the ability to process the way you do. So don't just yell at them and tell them this is going to happen. We show them. We encourage them. We talk to them about how we're going to move to the next. And so tonight, I really hope that you gain new information and new knowledge and feel equipped to go home and, and fight this battle and help us and partner with us because it's important. And so I'm so appreciative to all the speakers. Um, I'm going to invite Brian to come up and kind of close the time. I will just point out um, the surveys in these really help our program. There's good information. There's a how to talk to your team. There's another warnings checklist. You got the pill prescription drop off in here. Lots of good resources out there. Uh, we're going to do a Q&A here in just a minute. And there's individuals with name tags. Um, and also, if you came for CEUs, uh, go to the Know the Truth table to sign up for those CEUs. But any individual can take is affiliated with Know the Truth in Minnesota Dolphin Team Challenge, and they can answer questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. Uh, at this point, I'd like to invite all of our speakers up uh, as we can begin our Q&A. A couple of things. Two individuals that did not speak during the initial part will be up here speaking as well. And that's Captain Karen Latour from the Oakdale Police Department and Criminal Division Chief Fred Fink from the Washington County Attorney's Office. As these individuals come up on the stage, uh, here's how it's going to run. We have uh, two roving mics. Two individuals will be having mics to walk around, so just raise your hand if you have a question, we'll get to you. You can ask a general question and we can uh, direct that to the best individual. Or if you want to address a specific ind individual, go ahead and ask, ask that person a question. Um, when we do these, this is a very passionate, sort of emotional topic, and what we ask, though, is that every time, uh, if you ask to speak, it's a specific question as opposed to a comment. All of these individuals will be here after the fact to address, talk, uh, tell stories, but we ask for specific questions as well. Um, we started a little bit later. Q&A was supposed to be from 8 to 8.30. Right now it's about 20 after, so we will go about uh, 10 or 15 minutes longer as long as there's questions. Um, for the panel, so I see if we have uh, any individuals have any questions for our panel at this time. Right over here. So you hear from credentials to tell us as parents and who you know what to do if our kids fall into addiction. What are we going to do about? The kids are in recovery and making it a place where they're accepted, where they, I know that there's like, you know, teen meetings and stuff like that, but there's definitely lacking young people's places to go, things to do, you know, to keep them in recovery, to have that support, because I, I have a daughter, she was a student, she came out, nobody's sober at school. Um, there's not a lot of young people's meetings around, you know, to a 16-year-old, a 22-year-old is an old person. So, so what are we going to do about that? Great, great, uh, great question. I think that um, there needs to be a lot more. I think as um, there, you know, there's a bar on every corner. There's uh, all of that um, stuff for individuals, and it's kind of socially acceptable. It's very uh, big in our culture. And so I think that uh, there is some resources, um, you know, uh, and they do a great job of trying to create activities and things like that. There's different groups. Um, there's a couple sober um, hangouts. So if you search online, it's, again, it's you know one for every 500 of the other ones. And so we got to do a better job of making that ratio bigger and giving them more activities. Um, and that's one of the hardest things is kind of creating that community. I know one thing um, is a lot of uh, the different entities really try for someone going through recovery if they've been arrested. There's a thing called drug court where they can go through that kind of helps them um, and it really brings the different parts together, probation, county attorney, law enforcement, all of those things to really give them a support group. Um, but uh, I think there needs to be more, absolutely. And so um, there is a little bit out there, but again, it can be hard to find. Question right up front here. Or you have one in the back? Um, one of your things was you can have a child. My question is, if you ask questions of them all the time and you know they're lying all the time, kind of what's the point and what do you do if you know they're lying all the time? 
Adam, you want to talk or Lori? Um, yeah. Um, um, so I think that um, that's a, a great question. And a lot of times some of those warning signs, you know, like the change in school, disobedient, that kind of stuff, that can be in the kid, right? Um, and we know they go through phases. And so I think you gotta really look for a pattern of behavior and address patterns of behavior. So if the line's a pattern of behavior, I think there needs to be expectations and guidelines set up. I think the trouble is, is when we allow that behavior to continue, and no real consequences given for that. And so I think making it uncomfortable for them to do that behavior, and whatever that looks like, if that would look like different in each and every household, I believe, um, but really kind of make that stamp like, we've gotta do something different each time, right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different results. We gotta change it up and to get the result that we need and really provide them the opportunity to succeed in their life. I don't know if you have a response to the constant line. I, I guess I kind of with Ryan and Lisa too, but um, I think as a parent, you know your own child, and if you, if you suspect something's happening, it probably is. Um, as a parent, you have every right to go through their things, log on to their Facebook while they're sitting there. I, I was surprised at what I found. Um, but as, as a parent, I can speak specifically to with heroin. If you suspect it and you find it, um, my husband and I searched rural his room. We found it. What did that do? Was it we already, you know, suspected? Um, take action and get them into treatment. Um, don't let them talk throughout this. My husband and I have talked what would we do differently. We would have gotten them into treatment right away. There wouldn't have been a choice at all. Um, and, and you know your kids best. Um, and, and we as parents, you know, um, I can say one of the things I learned at the first warning that I did is that they will come up to your house and search your house. I can tell you it would have saved us hours and hours and hours of searching and craziness, and they're here to help. Um, you know, we could have taken action right then. Robert Bailey, do you want to speak to what uh, difference uh, or different questions your parents might have asked, or, or how they could have maybe intervened in, in your particular story? Um, the one thing I'll just say is I have parents that always say, you know, if you drink, if you're drinking at a party, call us. You can always call us. We're always looking for you. Just the couple of times I would try to be honest, I don't think they meant to, but you know they kind of went to anger and like shaming me right off the bat, but just like really loving with your son or daughter and letting them know you love you that you love them and trying to get to the underlying issue of maybe why they're using them. You know, if they ever do come to you and they're honest about something, it's going to be hard. But try not to like shame them and get them down on them in that moment because that sometimes gets you know coming to you with them being honest like you wanted them to be. Um, I would just say along the lines of, I mean, because my mom's even sober after a while, so she started paying attention. It's like I didn't have that. I couldn't call my mom while drunk. If I did, she'd laugh and you know, hang up on me. So she wasn't able in that sense, but it was like. Kind of what she said, like, if, if you have intuition as a parent and you think something's up, it's up. Every one of my friends would come around the hall and say, I don't like that guy, he's something wrong with him. No, 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 it's not him, it's me, don't worry about it. She was right about every single one of them. They were all criminals, they were all, like, you know, troublemaking kids, just like me. And they were all bad influences, and just like me. And if she would have done something, like, you know, there was a point in time where she said my friend didn't come around, and all I did was hang out with that friend still for the longest to be hiding in my basement going on the stairs, you know, just following through, you know, and, and with the treatment thing, you know, it's, I got threatened with treatment so many times, and it's like, and so you actually put your foot down and just do it, you know, call the cops, and my mom, my mom called the cops a bunch of times, you know, and honestly, in the moment, it helped me, because I, I went to jail that night, and you gotta be stern, just, you know, like they said, your, 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 your kids have friends, they don't need another friend, they need a parent, and you have to be stern with them, you can't, you know, go with your gut, it's always right, I promise you. Thank you. I was just curious if anybody is addressing the situation with the low beds that we have for admitting kids that are under the influence once they go into the yards and have a hard time getting them actually into treatment centers. I know the Lewis family had this problem and they had to bring their son home and then monitor them themselves. And I get that we have the police here and I I see that we do have the Minnesota Teen Challenge here. But what about the hospital and what about treatment center and you know, people, if they're gonna go and call you guys and get your kid into in, the hospital, where do they go from there? And you don't wanna bring your child home and back to the CHP 
situation. Yeah, there's um, there's a county detox centers that they can go to, um, holding facilities. Um, we've encouraged people to do a 72-hour hold at a hospital um, until the bed opens. Um, one thing that we're trying to do in the treatment industry is make that um, easier. We know we have to capitalize on that moment. Uh, we know that after they get a little bit of sobriety, they might think, oh, I can do this without treatment. But we know that they need treatment. And so, um, you know, having Rule 25 assessors go to there to be able to get the funding figured out, to be able to expedite the process, to move it from two weeks to a couple days, to get them into treatment um, and open up beds and give more opportunities um, to individuals to get into an open bed. And so there is a huge need. Uh, we are doing some things to address it and trying to move uh, towards that. Um, but yeah, I don't know if that answers your question, but we are working, we are recognizing that. And as an industry, I think they are trying to be better. But a way around, you know, if you are in that situation where they're saying, you know what, you can say, I want them on a 72-hour hold. I want them to stay here. For 72 hours, you have that ability as a parent to put them on a 72-hour hold, or as their guardian, if they're not in um, the ability to make their own decisions with them, and they can stay there for 72 hours, and then that gives you a chance to call some treatment centers and get some things lined up. Is, uh, you have one right here? Right. This question is mostly for Bailey or Rob. Um, we have a son who's in recovery. And my question is, what can we do as parents to help them stay in recovery? What are you doing? What is helping them most? I guess just keep loving him and encouraging him um, and tell him you're proud of him as much as possible. And um, if you start to see him slip or step or get back into old patterns, call him out, call him out on that and just you know, make sure he keeps him open line of communication with you. I always say the same thing as far as old behaviors go. I mean, it's it's really hard to be sober for a month, and it's really easy to relapse things. And, you know, it can happen just like that. No doc goes into it, it's one phone call away. So just, um, as far as relaxing goes, you know, like I said prior, just be really firm with it, be really direct, but at the same time, try to be understanding that it is the hardest thing to probably ever going to go through in your life. And um, there's a difference between supporting and enabling. You know, um, I wouldn't, I just, if I was under the influence or anything like that, my mom would never let me go home. I mean, I still ended up using so I mean, it, it had its it had its effect on me. So I would just say it, it's more than just the using, it's like who they're with, where they're going, you know, like it, it's it all revolves around the patient, in my opinion. So I would just say watch the little things, you know, such as who they're hanging out with, how they're talking, what music they're listening to, you know, things like that are honestly things that can lead people back into it. I was just gonna add one thing too is we always hope that we stay sober forever, but if there happens to be a relapse, just maybe supporting them through that, getting the help they need, so it is just like a lapse and not a full, full relapse. There's one on the back as well. When your child is over 18, how much, what legal rights do you have as a parent to help them, to get them help. Um, you know, I've heard from other people that, you know, once, once they're an adult, you don't have the right or whatever, they don't have to listen to you. Um, what, what can you say about that, you know, for people who have children over 18? Well, law enforcement can get involved at that point, obviously. And if the child, the adult now, your kid, isn't listening anymore, um, 18 is kind of the magic number where if they didn't get it to that point, now we have the opportunity to get involved on our own. And I think uh, Mr. Orbit can address what can happen at that point now, now that they are in the system, um, as a user, as an addict. 
Yeah, I'm like, sorry. There's not too many things that are into people. I mean, can I throw my kid in the car and kidnap them and take them to the team challenge? I won't charge you if you did it. That's <laughs> Except like what we talked about earlier and what Mike just talked about. Pick up the phone. My kids got some stuff. You know, and trust that, you know, we're gonna help you get the kid off the area. Otherwise, you call us. It's true, you are. There's one in the back, so waiting as well. She's asking about a zebra pen in terms of a vaping pen and Was if that's it characterized as a vaping pen? No, he just used it in a text message. Someone said, Do you do you have a piece? And he said, I have a zebra pen. That's and probably what he's talking about. For vaping? Yes. Yeah, any reference to in, uh, pens and cigs and <laughs> if he asked if you had a piece, he's definitely not talking about a writing utensil. Um, he's for sure talking about something so good. I was thinking a piece was like a pipe. Yeah, definitely. But I'm wondering if he's um, just smoking marijuana to use him as cash oil in a vaping pen. I'm trying to figure out what a zebra pen is. Uh, yeah, that could be that could be either or. I mean, that's something we're going to investigate, but I mean, a zebra pen, I don't know how to finish a pile of person, but I'm 23 years old, like I said, I'm, I'm old, so, you know, <laughs> but yeah, I'm pretty sure that's very possible. <coughs> if if they characterize it as a pen, it's probably, it's, it's probably vaping. I mean, that's the, that's the new call of your kid. 16? Yeah, I mean, it's, I've got a 16 year old in the house, too, and it's, uh, that's what they talk about. And before they changed the law, everybody could buy them. It wasn't regulated. You didn't have to be 18 to buy them. And they could buy them online, and now they can have friends buy them. They're, they're easily obtainable. So I wouldn't be surprised if that's what it was. Um, and you just have to investigate further as to what they're you know, using for. We do have time for uh, another question or two if individuals have that. Otherwise, we can uh, wrap up and respect of everyone's time. We do have one more question up here. Blocking. 
Um, and so if anyone doesn't know what methadone is, it's basically uh, if you take it and it makes you sick if you try to use heroin while you're on it. Um, but it can still be abused, it can still create a high. And so uh, we recognize uh, the role that it can play, um, but you can speak to uh, the Washington County aspect. I'm gonna hand it over to the sheriff. Uh, but there's one thing I do wanna say. Just a sort of a non sequitur. Steve's law came out last year, and this is named after Steve Hummer, who died of an overdose while his buddy was there watching. His buddy was too scared to pick up the phone because he thought, uh oh, oh, if I call, the cops are going to put me in jail. Well, the law now is if you call, if you and your friend are doing drugs together, and you have called because your friend has an out, nothing will happen to you. You might get congratulated by your friend's folks savings of their life. Nothing will happen to you. Now, it doesn't apply to dealers, however. So if Lori and I were doing drugs and she started passing out, I call the phone and go 911. We're doing drugs. We're trying heroin. I'm doing it too. I'm admitting it. Nothing will happen to me. Uh, I think that's an important point. We're trying to save lives. The question was asked about methadone within the jail. But it's one of those things that with like even um, narcotic medication, um, what a lot of people don't know is for every narcotic medication, there's a non-narcotic option. So just because they're prescribing Oxycontin doesn't mean that that's the only thing that you could take to help in that scenario. It really depends on the level of pain and all of those things. But there's a non-narcotic option. Just like Adderall is at that level very addictive, Concerta is a medication that is given less talked about, is given uh, for um, ADD, which is less, uh, there's less of an ability, availability to abuse it, or the ability to abuse it. So methadone is much easier to abuse and overdose on than Suboxone because of the way that it's consumed in the way that uh, it is made. Thank you. Sorry, any more thoughts? All right. Well, thank you. Just uh, out of respect of everyone's time, we're going to wrap this up. Do we have one over here? All right. Last question. Thank you. I would say right now, as far as uh, just, you know, coming to Teen Challenge, I, I identify you know, they don't just say, well, you're addicted to you're an alcoholic. Oh, and I want to just say, don't do it. Keep your own story. First of all, it's a year long program, okay? A year's a long time, okay? <laughs> like, I'm 10 months in, holy crap. But I would just say, <laughs> mostly it's uh, just be, having the parents that I had, not having a father, having a very alcoholic mother. I mean, all I wanted growing up was a father and a mother who wasn't an alcoholic. So to be a father to my daughter and not be an alcoholic at the same time, that's just enough by itself, honestly, to just the joy that it brings me to even be around my daughter. Losing the selfishness that I had in my addiction, I see how much my actions do affect others. You know, it's not just, well, I'm just affecting myself, I'm drinking my life away. No, you know, I have my daughter, and my fiance, I have my mother, I have my brother, who are all loving and caring about me, you know, so I'm pretty much, was pretty much just going down the drain. So the, the bright future, too, that uh, Minnesota Teen Challenge is helping to gain, like, I'm going places now, man, I'm doing big things, and I, Teen Challenge is big for it, honestly, so, 
Um, I would just say, there's once you get your foot in the door, like for anyone who wants to be sober, or, you know, tell someone in transition, you know, it, it gets easier. You know, it doesn't get harder. It really gets easier, and it gets more rewarding, and it gets more um, routine. I guess you could say. I, I can't imagine what that would bring to me. So yeah. Thank you very much. Again, all of our panelists uh, will be available after for any uh, questions, comments, or discussion you'd like to have with them. So I would like to end this with, first of all, thanking all of our panelists, and specifically Rob and Bailey for sharing your story. Thank you very much. And I think most importantly, Lori and the Lewis family, thank you very much for sharing your family's struggle. County Attorney Orbit asked or stated that we wish that this auditorium would be filled and we would definitely do this presentation if there are five people or 5,000 people sitting in this auditorium. So thank you all for being here. Please spread the word. If you remember, I asked you at the beginning to think about two things of collaboration. As I look around, I see again parents, grandparents, adults, children, educators, uh, friends of law enforcement from others. There's a commander from Ramsey County here. Thank you for being here. Um, hopefully you see at this panel the amount of collaboration um, that we're trying to work towards to, uh, to help people with this issue. Um, and then secondly, as Adam stated very eloquently, the face of addiction has changed. And that is a message that we're trying to push forward. So in closing, I just want to say thank you very much. We are in gratitude to Minnesota Adult Teen Challenge and know the truth for your collaboration with these events and we hope to uh, partner forward. So thank you very much. <laughs> Have a good evening and drive safe.